Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. For people who need to be motivated, or I don't know what another word for this is, uh, to be, um, let's see, more than motivated, it's to be calmed. To, it's an aha kind of a thing. When Linda Sage decides that she's going to write something, she she says it comes sometimes from somebody she just met, or maybe she's been dreaming, or she just thought about it. But I'd sure like to be on her wavelength because Linda is such a wordsmith. But it's not just a wordsmith. It's a, uh, I don't know, quotation smith or somebody. What, what do you call yourself, really, Linda Sage? <laughs> Hi, Anita. I'm trying to think myself what I would say. Um, I try to, I think I'm a little bit of a storyteller. Okay. And in that story, in a very brief story, I try to make an inspiring and encouraging message. Okay, so maybe you're an encouragement master. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) But uh, it is so enjoyable. I know you were at the last Cure Symposium, and we had that monk who was very interesting, and he was that way. Did you notice that? I did. He he was wonderful, and he started with a story. And, you know, that's a very, very good way to pull people in and get their interest in what you want to talk about, is to start with a story or a quotation and then make your point from that story. And that's exactly what the monk did at the Cure Symposium. Yes, and he's going to come on the radio uh, in some time, I think this coming month. So that I think he's in China right now, but he really was special. But just think, and of course, the name of your column every month is called Think Yes. So this isn't just a column about dogs and different things that are fun and happy, no. This is something that makes you want to think, and you want to think positively. So let's just go through this. Now, I asked you if you would just bring forth some of your, I don't know how many columns you've written for, it's 50 or something like that, a lot. Monthly since October of 2012. Oh, what happens when you're having so much fun? You forget, but time goes by, and... So that's three times, so it's 36, maybe 40, yeah. um, 40 columns. Okay, so well, you have probably some favorites or ones that we get letters all the time about Linda's columns. She gets letters, about, someone says, as though it were written just for her, for that person. Isn't that funny? You know, I, I really, that's something that I try to do is have a universal message. It's always an encouraging message, an inspiring message, a positive message. But the point that I make in each column or the story that I tell is applicable to, you know, many people in many different situations. And the column that I just turned into you that will be in the December issue I was inspired to write it to encourage someone who just lost a job. You don't know that from reading the column, that it's about a person or losing a job. Um, But I wrote this column, and it's encouraging. It's about change and facing change and knowing that having faith that you've gotten through challenges in your life before, you'll get through this one. So that's kind of the message in a general way, and I sent it to my son. I always send my son my columns to read, (laughs) and and he said, oh, my gosh, this applies to me. So he got something out of it for the, you know, challenges in his life that he's facing. So I try to just give a a universal message that would apply to people in any number of situations because the message is underlying all of the columns and stories and quotes, there are a couple of similar themes that I'm always working with. And one is that we have a choice. We don't always think that. We sometimes think we're victims and we're stuck and there's nothing we can do. And sometimes there is nothing we can do about a situation. 
but we always have a choice about how we react. So that's one of the themes. Knowing that we have that power, that we're at choice. Um, knowing that we, another theme is that really anything that we are experiencing, there are different ways of looking at it. You can shape and frame and look at any kind of a situation from your point of view. So it might look bad, but you could stop and say, what's good about it? And I'll give you an example of, of a story in one of the columns that illustrates how you can view things from different viewpoints. And it was one of the columns that I uh, wrote that told started with a story about two salesmen who were, was, they were sent to a remote island to assess the um, opportunity for selling shoes on this island. And the first salesman comes back and says, oh my gosh, they don't wear shoes. There's, there's no opportunity. And the second salesman comes back and says, oh my gosh, they don't wear shoes. The opportunity is unlimited. So that's kind perfect. Of a, yeah, that's kind of a theme that I work through a lot of the columns is, you know, you could have the same situation but there are different ways to view it. You know, and that famous quote by Wayne Dyer is, hostile people live in a hostile world, and loving people live in a loving world. Same world. Beautiful. That is so, again, so true, how do we look at these? So those are the kinds of things that I weave into my columns in all different ways, but it's about our thoughts, our attitudes, our ability to to um, react to situations, and so that's kind of those are kind of the universal themes. So that applies to any situation and any type of person. I get a lot out of it personally. Just like you said, this last one I just happened to see that will be in our December issue, and. Anyone that is busy, there are always challenges. When you wake up, there's a challenge. Should you do this? Should you do that? Or what happened? Or what are you going to do? So we're all filled with challenges, and you're absolutely right. You start brushing your teeth, and you start thinking about it, and then you can either, you know, you may uh, have some other things that you're late on, and you have to do this, but it's really the way that you say, and many times... When I very, if I get frustrated about something and, it, and it's not really going my way, I'll say, wait a minute, wait a minute. So what about those people over in, well, it could be in Turkey, someplace that, where they don't even know where they're going to eat the next day or if their children are going to be alive. And I, what I, I don't know what you call this, but I always try to think of situations that are so terrible and that, I'm in such a good position, so what's this one little thing? So what? That's a great strategy, and that is actually, you know, so valid because no matter what is going on in anybody's life, there are people all over the world who have it much worse. And so you're right. I, I do the same thing. I'll think about um, the people who have been devastated by floods and tsunamis and hurricanes and, you know, people who are living in the midst of war and people who don't have fresh water to shower with or to drink. You know, I mean, if, if there's nothing wrong with thinking about all of the other kinds of tragedies in the world to put a different perspective you know, that is a perspective, is how important is this situation that you're going through? Is it going to matter in five years? Is there anything you can do about it? Is there anything lesson or any good that could come out of it? So if you start working with yourself by comparing yourself to some real tragedies in the world, you get just gave some examples, um, yeah, that then it puts in perspective what you're going through. Everybody goes through struggles. No one's going through life without struggles and challenges. So knowing that that's a part of life, 
you know, how can you make the best of it? And that's kind of what I try and encourage people to do. Well, let me just tell everybody, you're listening to this marvelous woman. Her name is Linda Sauge, S-A-U-G-E-Y, excuse me, S-A-U-G-E-T, S-A-U-G-E-T. And she's the author of a book. That's how I first met her. It's If You Think It. And that's really important because it's just what Linda said. Depends how what you think about something. You could think about it in a positive way or a negative way, and that's what will happen most of the time. So if you want to email her, you can do that at L Sauge, S-A-U-G-E-T, 99, at AOL.com. And I'm laughing. She's not 99. Sometimes people put their age in there. <laughs> so it's L Sauge, 99 at AOL.com. Linda, if you have a website, you may not have one yet, but you, I was thinking about that. Do you have I one? I do. Oh, good. I, I oh, do have one. Okay. Then you, you should be putting maybe all your YouTubes on that website. You're right. Because you then have all your, your radio shows on the website. And I don't know if you have your columns on the website. I do. Okay, but you should be having all your radio shows. You've done a lot of them, you know, with us. Yeah, I would appreciate it so much. Yeah, my website is the uh, based on the book title. So it's www.ifyouthinkit.com. Well, we're going to change that then in our magazine because we don't have it listed. Oh, okay. Well, and thanks. I'm going to do that. That's something. You ah. see, that's why you did the show today, even though you're busy <laughs> and all I know. But so, keep my email address in because nothing makes me feel better than when people write me and tell me that a particular column meant a lot to them, it inspired them, it helped them. I had I forwarded you one that I just received right. um, last week. And I love when people, you know, take the time to do that because that's really what that's what I want to be doing in my writing and in my columns is to really encourage and to inspire and to help people. And I think, you know, there's so many ways that we do that in our life every day, but it's such a privilege to be able to do that through, you know, through your magazine and through the writing of that column. So, so oh, All right. So it's, I just want to confirm this. So if someone would go to, if you think it, websites if you think it dot com. dot com they could then go and see the columns that you've written they can see the columns it's like the very last um tab on it, it um that's okay i'm going to put it into the magazine and they'll just go to your website and i'll just say that if you would like to see her past columns okay yeah, and then there is, you know, you'll they'll get to see, read about the book and see some. Okay. You know, it's a good website. So. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do that. There's a little that. video on there. There is? I, um, yeah, I'm going to get on your website. That, I haven't seen it. What's on the video? The video was done by the publisher of the book, and so it's kind of an introduction to the book. Huh. It just, a one, I think it's like one minute and, you know, nine seconds or something. Okay. It's really professionally done. And it's just a beautiful introduction to what, if you think it, is all about. And so, yeah, go on my website. I can't believe it. I haven't seen it. <laughs> well, okay, so now let's, uh, let's continue. There, you use sometimes, I love the ones when you use monks or you use philosophers, and they have so much to say that, let's say you have an idea, and then you always seem to be able to match it up with someone who's a philosopher or an important person. Yes. It, it kind of is the reverse of that. It's I see a quote or a story, and it will, some, it will resonate in some way with me, and then I'll base a column or um, an idea around a quote. So, you know, an example, and this is, I had seen... Uh, the quote a long time ago uh, about the Wizard of Oz from the Good Witch, Linda. And she says, to, she says, um, you had the power all along, my dear. <laughs> and I don't know why that quote stuck with me, but I thought about it. 
Then I started thinking about The Wizard of Oz, and every single one of those characters had what they were looking for. You know, the the Tin Man was smart, and the Cowardly Lion was brave, and the Scarecrow, you know, had a heart. He was loving. So every character in there, um, including Dorothy, they had what they were seeking, but they didn't know it until the Wizard of Oz told them. So I based a column on that. Yes, I remember you did, and that yeah. is really true, that you, you're looking for something that you already have. Yep, and it's, it's so true. You know, they were searching, and they were going to see this wizard who was a fraud, but when he told them, you know, you have a heart, you have courage, um, then they believed it. And I think there's, you know, there's a message, and you don't think about the movie The Wizard of Oz in that, those terms, but there's a message in there um, to what you're seeking. Do you have already what you're seeking? And I think we all do. We have at least the kernel of it. So, so that's how, so how I come up with these columns, and I never know until I sit down to write it how it's going to come out. You know, it just evolves. I do many drafts and tweak it. But either a story or a quotation um, will speak to me in some way. And then I will develop a column. And what I like about it, too, Anita, is that the columns are 250 words, you know, 260 in that range. And it's short enough so people could sit down and read it and get the message of the column just in five minutes. It's not like committing to a, you know, a 500-page book to read to, before you get all the information. So it's short, which I like, and, and that keeps, it keeps me on my toes to edit it and just get to the meat, in a, you know, hopefully in an interesting way. I just reviewed the book of the month for December, and it's really a book of poetry. The woman is 90, in her 90s. and But she wrote this, I think, probably 10 years or something like that before. But it's amazing what she could do. She would take a, some poems or six lines, and she tells the story. There are a couple of poems that, well, there's one that's 56 lines, and it's very, very deep and important. It was political, actually. And I was thinking, though, as as I was talking about you, and I mean, no, you were going to be on the show. I wonder if children would be able to take what you write, and maybe you do it in more of a child's voice or something, but Mm -hmm. you tell so many important Lessons, just like you said, it's you've had it all along. Maybe you would do something like that because we keep talking about you're writing a book, and maybe this is a children's book. I, I don't know if you ever thought about that. I have thought about ah. it. Because what I've thought, Anita, is that the things that I talk about in my book or in the column, these are things that I'm not sure we really teach our children. You know, it's definitely not in the curri- in the school curriculum, and I'm not sure a lot of parents. I mean, I think we as parents teach our children by just being who we are, and they model after us. So, if if you're optimistic, if you're a solution finder, if you're, you know, however you are, just in the normal course of your life, I think kids pick that up. But I think that this should be something that's consciously taught that children have a choice and that they they ha- can their attitudes their beliefs you know to become conscious of them because our lives move in the direction of our beliefs i mean we're seeing that so much now right now in our culture and society with so much expression of racism and you know so much negativity And those are the kinds of things that implant in children's minds. And I want to implant the opposite. I want them to feel resourceful and powerful and know that that their happiness lies within them, that they have the power. You know, so I have thought a lot about how to to reach children. 
probably a very good illustrator would be a an extra way to do this uh, because I have reviewed some books where the children's books where the illustrator makes the difference in what you're saying, but yeah, especially in a children's yes, book. Yes, that's sure. what I meant. Yeah, you know, but anyway, you have a lot to think about. So you're a busy professional, but yes, you also <laughs> but you also have this great avocation of writing and we feel so privileged to have you write for us each month, uh, really. And you know, Linda, the the whole part of this is funny too to mention this that we was just talking about writing. Do you know that children now in school are not being taught cursive writing? I heard that. It's I can't believe that to me. And I can I understand that everything is computers, so kids type you know, so they see the 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 printed letter on a keyboard and they are typing. But it just is amazing to me that they are not learning cursive writing. What That's about amazing. everything that is in cursive writing? Well, maybe they won't ever be able to read it. Yeah, I know. And, I, you know, I saw, I don't know if I'll tell the joke exactly, and it, it wasn't a, a joke per se, but I, I saw something um, that, like, grandparents were saying, you know, they could have a whole secret communication with each other because they could just write messages to each other and the kids would never know what's being said. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really true. Uh, so I, uh, but I don't know if that's, I mean, look, I still, just to keep up my, uh, my adding and subtracting and multiplying, even though I have a calculator on my phone and other places, I always try to do this from memory. I always try to subtract, add, multiply, and just do it. And then I can I know, always recheck do it. Do you? I do. Because I'm afraid I'm going to lose it. So, yeah, I, I think it's, it's amazing that there will be a whole generation and many generations to follow that have no idea what cursive writing is. They won't be able to read it. They won't be able to write it. Hmm. It's hard to comprehend. Yeah, maybe we're just old folkies. I have no idea. Well, that's what I wonder when I hear, you know, I ask myself that. Am I just so Mm old-fashioned? Yeah, I mean, everything has changed so amazingly, but that's uh, the way it is. Well, let's talk about a few more uh, before we have to say goodbye. There are a couple more that I know in my mind are pretty spectacular, but when, when you... I don't know if you've covered this. When someone dies or there's been a major accident, it's very hard to take something and say, well, it's the way you look at it. Have you? I don't know if you've done some on this. Have you? I don't know if I've done specifically with death. Um, I have done some with illness. You know, the thing is, you're right. There's, you know, there is, no way to reframe that and reshape it so that it's a positive thing or it's a good thing. It's just that's a sad and tragic situation when somebody um, dies. But the thing, the way I would approach that in a column is there's not, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. There are certain things in life that just have to be accepted. And there's nothing you can do if somebody that, you know, your your loved one um, dies, you're going to grieve, you're going to mourn, you're going to take as much time as necessary to do that. But at some point, you have to go forward, you have to move on, because you can make yourself miserable by not accepting it. And, but there are just certain things in life, whether they happen to us or they happen to a loved one, that at some point you have to acknowledge there's nothing you can do about it. And if that's the case, then if you want to have any semblance of happiness in your life, you have to accept it. And acceptance isn't resignation. Acceptance is just acknowledging what is and then moving forward so that's the that you know if i wrote a column i am not sure what story i would tell or what quotes i would use but the message of it would be that that um 
when there's nothing you can do about it, there's nothing you can do. So and if, you have choices. True, that's miserable. right. Always have choices, right? Yeah, you could be miserable and you can be angry and you can be bitter or you could just say, oh, you know, this is what happened. There's nothing I can do about it. And after my period of mourning and grieving, um, I'm going to go forward. Well, there's something new that I don't think many years ago was the norm, but now people celebrate the life of the person that died. Yes. And that's a very new thing where they put all their special objects or or whatever they had up at the front yep. of the of the place where everyone has gathered and they remember them with celebration. Now it's easy to do that with someone who's in their 90s because they've lived a very long life. I'm sure it's much more difficult if it's a child. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no question that's probably one of the most difficult things anybody ever faces or experiences in their life. So, you know, you can't make light of it. But I have um, been to um, Celebration of Life services, and it's beautiful. You know, it's it's beautiful because everybody is going to die. Like you said, if you're yep. a 90-year-old, it's easier. Right, 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 um, right. But it's so much. Not, it's so wonderful when you do look back on someone's life and yeah. appreciate all the good. Well, I look back. I'll always look back on your life, and you can always look back on my life because we've certainly had a great friendship. And this is important, isn't it? It is. And oh my we, gosh! And we have to say goodbye. But I hope to see you uh, very soon. And we appreciate everything that you've done. And oh, have a, a, a wonderful holiday, and we'll talk to you again, Linda. All right, Anita, thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye-bye.